welcome. My name's Dr. Jason W. Morrison, and I'm a theologist from New South Wales, Australia. Psychologists help people with themselves and other people, and theologists help people with themselves and God. Good morning, Dr. Jason W. Morrison, 7.23 a.m. Daylight saving time, New South Wales, Australia. I'm a theologist. Um, not the best one around, but I get the job done. Um, we're going to have a look at Romans. Romans chapter 1. Paul. Now, who was Paul? Let's have a look at the Bible Hub. Why Saul became Paul? Paul was previously known as Saul, a Pharisee. And let's read what it says about this. Hitherto the apostle has been known by the former of these names. Henceforth, forward, he is known exclusively by the latter. Hitherto he has been second to his friends Barnabas, henceforth he is first. In an earlier verse of the chapter we read that Barnabas and Saul were separated for their ministry, missionary work, and again that it was Barnabas and Saul for whom the governor of Cyprus sent to hear the word of the Lord. But in a subsequent verse of the chapter, we read that Paul and his company loosed from Pathos. The change in the order of the names is significant, and the change in the names not less so. Why was it that at this period the apostle took up this new designation? I think that the coincidence between his name and that of the governor of Cyprus, who believed at his preaching, Sergius Paulus, is too remarkable to be accidental. And although no doubt it was the custom for the Jews of that day, especially for those of them who lived in Gentile lands, to have for convenience sake two names, one Jewish and one Gentile, one for use amongst their brethren and one for use amongst the heathen, still we have no distinct intimation that the Apostle bore a Gentile name before this moment. And the fact that the name which he bears now is the same as that of the first convert seems to me to point the explanation. I take it then that the assumption of the name of Paul instead of the name of Saul occurred at this point, stood in some relation to his missionary work and was intended in some sense as a memorial of his first victory in the preaching of the gospel. I think that there are lessons to be derived from the substitution of one of these names for the other which we may occupy us for a few moments. <clears throat> First of all, then, the new name expresses a new nature. Jesus gave the apostle whom he called to himself in, which, in the early days a new name in order to prophesy the change which, by the dis discipline of sorrow and the communication of the grace of God, should pass over Simon Barjona, making him into a Peter, a man of rock. With his characteristic independence, Saul chooses for himself a new name, which shall express the change that he feels he has passed over his innermost being. True, he does not assume it at his conversion, but that is no reason why we should not believe that he assumes it because he is beginning to understand what it is that has happened to him at his conversion. The fact that he changes his name as soon as he throws himself into public and active life is but gathering into one picturesque symbol his great principle. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and all things have become new. So, dear brethren, we may, from this incident before us, gather this one great lesson that the central heart of Christianity is the possession of a new life, communicated us to us through faith in that Son of God, who is the Lord of the Spirit, wherever soever, wheresoever there is a true faith, there is a new nature. 
Opinions may play upon the surface of a man's soul, like moonbeams on the silver sea, without raising its temperature one degree or sending a single beam into its dark caverns. But that is the sort of Christianity that satisfies a great many of you, a Christianity of opinion, a Christianity of surface creed, a Christianity which at the best slightly modifies some of our outward actions, but leaves the whole inner man unchanged. Paul's Christianity meant a radical change in his whole nature. He went out of Jerusalem a persecutor. He came into Damascus a Christian. He rode out of Jerusalem hating, loathing, despising Jesus Christ. He groped his way into Damascus broken, bruised, clinging contrite to his feet and grasping his cross as his only hope. He went out proud, self-reliant, plumbing himself upon his many prerogatives, his true blood, his pure descent, his rabbinical knowledge, his pharisaical training, his external religious earnestness, his rigid morality. He rode into Damascus blind in the eyes, but seeing in the soul, and discerning that all things these things were, as he says in his strong, vehement way, but dumb in comparison with his winning of Christ. And his theory of conversion, which he preaches in all his epistles, is but the generalization of his own personal experience, which suddenly and in a moment smote his old self to shivers and raised up a new life with new tastes, new views, new tendencies and aspirations, with new allegiance to a new king, or allegiance to a new king. Such changes, so sudden, so revolutionary, cannot be expected often to take place amongst people who, like us, have been listening to Christian teaching all our lives. But unless there be in this infusion of a new life into men's spirits, which shall make them love and long and aspire after new things that once they did not care for, I, now, I know not why we should speak of them as being Christians at all. The transition is described by Paul as passing from death unto life. That cannot be a surface thing. A change which needs a new name must be a profound change. Has our Christianity revolutionized our nature in any such fashion? It is easy to be a Christian after the superficial fashion which passes muster with so many of us. A verbal acknowledgement of belief in truths which we never think about purely external performance of acts of worship, a subscription or two winged by no sympathy and a fairly respectable life beneath the cloak of which all evil may burrow undetected, or may burrow undetected. Make the Christianity of thousands. <clears throat> Paul's Christianity transformed him. Does yours transform you? If it does not, you are quite sure that it is Christian. Is it, are you quite sure that it's Christianity at all? And this goes on and on and on, on for quite some time. All about Paul. Have you, my brother, that faith by which we receive into our spirits Christ's own spirit to be our life? If you have, then you are a new creature, with a new name, perhaps but dimly visible and faintly audible amidst the imperfections of earth, but sure to shine out onto the pages of the Lamb's Book of Life, and to be read with tumults of acclaim before the angels of heaven. I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saveth he that receives it. So Paul, <clears throat> a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Now what's an apostle? Well, we can look it up, can't we? Watch. Um, let's just type in here. What is an apostle? Oh, Wikipedia. An apostle is in its most literal sense, is an emissary from the Greek, apostolos, literally one who is sent off from the verb apostolalin, to send off. The purpose of such sending off is usually a com to convey a message and thus messenger is a common alternative translation. Other common translations include ambassador and employee. Now there's a picture of the Apostle Paul by Rembrandt. <clears throat> of 
called to be an apostle separated to the gospel of God. Now, what is the gospel of God? We've got to get this right. Gospel of God. Well, we'll look at this. I've been a pastor for 33 years now, but I've shied away from preaching through Romans. To be honest, it has always intimidated me. No, nah, not interested in that. What is the gospel? In a day of depressing headlines and uncertainty all around us, good news is very welcome. What better news could be there? Could there be than, as the old hymn says, the vilest offender who truly believes? That moment from Jesus a pardon receives. When Christians refer to the gospel, they are referring to the good news that Jesus Christ died to pay for the penalty of our sin so that we might become the children of God through faith alone in Christ alone. In short, the gospel is the sum total of the saving truth as God has communicated it to lost humanity as it is revealed in the person of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Scriptures, the Bible. If you aren't sure whether you, whether or not you are God's child, you might want to read God's plan of salvation before you read on in this lesson. So the gospel is the good news that we are saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now, we'd have to go to Matthew 1 for that, wouldn't we? The genealogy of Jesus Christ. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And the genealogy takes us down through the, ge the genealogy, showing that Joseph was a descendant of David. Thus, although Joseph was Jesus' stepfather, um, he was still an ancestor of David. According to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith. Now what's obedience to the faith? Because this can get all muddled up, can't it? It can get all muddled up. Now, where do we go for that? We might go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> okay. Romans 4 verse 1. What shall we say? What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. So faith is definitely not something that we do. It's something that we believe, and we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Among, the, his, among all nations for his name, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and, excuse me, the Lord Jesus Christ. Desire to visit Rome. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Now, notice he thanked God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to make a point here. Most religion teaches you that there's something you need to do or not do to keep God happy or stop him from being sad. And all that does is turn you evil. That's why there's so much trouble in religion today. I'm just going to clear my throat. And not many people are aware of this fact. Now, why is my camera going blurry all the time? There it is. Now, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and the peace that comes with that is something that we just believe, receive and remain assured in. 
A lot of Christians live in doubt that they're even saved at all. But here Paul approaches God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the problem for the Jehovah Witnesses is they just approach Jehovah however they please. Now I think it's fair if we ask the question, why do we have to approach God through the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, let's ask the question. Why do we approach God through the Lord Jesus Christ? Let's see what it says. That's a better question there. Um, okay, let's have a look. Uh, no, not interested in that. Um, that's about praying. How do we approach God? Let's have a look. We will continue with our with where we stopped last time. We saw very clearly last time even the angels were amazed with God's wisdom. Such a great salvation he provided for us. Unworthy sinners. The gospel is the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even the angels are subject to him. All principalities and powers are under one head, the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we approach God? Some approach God through a new experience, emotions. Someone has to pump their emotions high with music or with emotional preaching so they can get high on emotions. Many are deceived that they can access God this way. Some approach God through their traditions, lighting candles, incense, worshipping an image. Some say that they cannot approach God as they are sinful, so they ask the priest or the minister to pray on behalf of them so they can approach God. The question is, <clears throat> how do we approach God? Our way, the church way or God's way? There is only one answer and that's God's way. God's way is not through our zeal or emotions but according to his instructions only. <clears throat> now, why isn't it just saying that we approach God through the Lord Jesus Christ? John 14, 6, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. So there's the evidence that we only approach God through the Lord Jesus Christ that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve, with my spirit. Now here's another question. Now the Jehovah Witnesses, I understand, don't believe that people have a spirit. Let's just, let's just see what this says, happens here. Um, do JWs think they have a spirit? Let's just see what it says. Um, no, we're not going to get anything like that. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and the Human Spirit. Let's see what happens there. Um... Because the Jehovah Witnesses... Oh, here we are. Let's have a look. Let's just have a look. It's coming. The Complete Answer Book. Collector's Edition. Hank Hangraf. He must be German. What happens... Why isn't this moving? Uh -huh. What happens when we die? Jehovah Witnesses and the soul of man. The Jehovah Witnesses deny that man has a soul or a spirit. Well, the Apostle Paul had a spirit that has conscious existence after death. 
I, Charles Taze Russell believed that we had a soul and a spirit. What does the Bible say to Jehovah's Witnesses? The word soul is interchangeable with the word human. In other words, they don't believe that humans possess souls, which are separate and distinct from the body. Rather, they maintain that humans are souls. This explains why Jehovah's Witnesses believe that a person ceases to exist upon death. Gee, that's, that's so wicked. The Bible, however, makes it clear that everyone has an inner being which survives after physical death. Admittedly, this is not conscious in the sense that he's not fully aware of the physical world, yet he remains a person who possesses both self-awareness and a unique identity. The Bible refers to this inner being as the soul or the spirit of mankind. Matthew 10.28 demonstrates that the scripture distinguishes the soul from the body, thereby disproving what Jehovah's Witnesses are clearly teaching. It reads, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Jesus tells us in this passage that the soul survives death even through, even though someone may kill the body. Furthermore, Matthew 17, which recounts not only the transfiguration of Christ but also his conversion with Moses, conversation with Moses and Elijah, shows that the soul is indeed conscious after death. After all, how else can Jesus carry on a dialogue with Moses who passed away centuries earlier? John 11.26 states that whoever believes in Jesus will never die, which explains Paul's statement in Romans 8.38 that not even death can separate us from God's love. Conversely, Revelation 20 tells us that the unsaved will experience eternal torment. Denying, by denying the reality of eternal punishment, Jehovah's Witnesses are saying that this passage cannot be taken seriously. Well, the truth of the matter is that Jesus not only taught us of heaven, but also taught us that hell is a tangible reality. And there you go. <clears throat> Very interesting, isn't it, what you can learn. So Paul has a, had a spirit, he admitted that, and you've got a spirit and I've got a spirit in the gospel of his son, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. That without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means, now at last, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. Now spiritual gifts... Establish people. Spiritual gifts establish people. So what are the spiritual gifts? What are the spiritual gifts? Well, I found this. What are the spiritual gifts? Spiritual gifts are a source of much controversy and confusion among believers. This is a sad commentary. As these gifts are meant to be graces from God for the edification of the church. Even today, as in the early church, the misuse and misunderstanding of spiritual gifts can bring division in the church. The resource, this resource seeks to avoid the controversies and simply explore what the Bible says about spiritual gifts. Well, we may as well have a look. Identifying and defining spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12 states that spiritual gifts are given to God's people by the Holy Spirit for the common good. Verse 11 says that the gifts are given according to God's sovereign will, as he determines. Ephesians 4.12 tells us these gifts are given to prepare God's people for service and for building up the body of Christ. The term spiritual gifts comes from the Greek word charismata, gifts, and pneumatica, spirits. They are the plural forms of charisma, meaning expression of grace, and pneumaticon, meaning expression of the Spirit, if I pronounce that properly, which I'm not sure about. While there are different kinds of gifts, 1 Corinthians 12.4, generally speaking, spiritual gifts are given God-given graces, special abilities, offices or manifestations, meant for works of service to benefit and build up the body of Christ as a whole. Although a great deal of disagreement exists between denominations, most Bible scholars classify the spiritual gifts into three categories. Ministry gifts, manifestation gifts, manifestation gifts and motivational gifts. 
The ministry gifts serve to reveal the plan of God. They are characteristic of full-time office or calling, rather than a gift that can be a function in and through any believer. The good way to remember the ministry gifts is through the five-finger analogy. An apostle. An apostle establishes and builds churches. He's a church planter. An apostle may function in many or all of the ministry gifts. He is the thumb. He is the thumb, the strongest of all the fingers, able to touch every finger. I can't really show that on there. <clears throat> the prophet. Prophet in the Greek means to foretell, in the sense of speaking for another. A prophet functions as God's mouthpiece, speaking forth God's word. The prophet is the index finger or pointer finger. He points to the future and points out sin. Evangelist. An evangelist is called to be a witness for Jesus Christ. He works for the local church to bring people into the body of Christ, where they can be discipled. He may evangelize through music, drama, preaching, and other creative ways. He is the middle finger, the tallest one who stands out in the crowd. Evangelists draw a lot of attention, but they are called to serve the local body. Pastor. The pastor is the shepherd of the people. A true shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The pastor is the ring finger. He is married to the church, called to stay, oversee, nurture, and guide. And teacher. The teacher and the pastor are often a shared office, but not always. The teacher lays down the foundation and is concerned with detail and accuracy. He delights in research to validate truth. The teacher is the pinky finger, though seemingly small and insignificant. He is designed specifically for digging into dark, tight, dark places, shining a light and picking apart the word of truth. The Manifestation Gifts The Manifestation Gifts serve to reveal the power of God. These gifts are supernatural or spiritual in nature. They can be further subdivided into three groups. Utterance, Power and Revelation Utterance These gifts say something. Power These gifts do something. Revelation These gifts reveal something. Utterance Gifts Prophecy this is the foretelling of the inspired word of God primarily to the church for the purpose of confirming the written word and building up the entire body. The message is usually one of edification, exhortation or consolation, although it can declare God's will in a particular circumstance and in, a rare, in rare cases predict future events. Speaking in tongues. This is a supernatural utterance in an unlearned language which is interpreted so that the entire body will be edified. Tongues may also be assigned to unbelievers, and you can learn more about that there. And there's the link for all this there. Interpretation of Tongues This is a supernatural interpretation of a message in tongues, translated into the known language so that the hearers, the entire body, will be edified. Power Gifts Faith This is not the faith that is measured to every believer, nor is it saving faith. This is special supernatural faith given by the Spirit to receive miracles or to believe God for miracles. Healing. This is supernatural healing beyond natural means by, given by the Spirit. Miracles. This is a supernatural suspension of natural laws or an intervention by the Holy Spirit into laws of nature. And the revelation gives. Word of wisdom. This is a supernatural knowledge applied in a godly or correct way. One commentary describes it as insight into doctrinal truth. Word of knowledge. This is supernatural knowledge of facts and information that can only be revealed by God for the purpose of applying doctrinal truth. And discerning of spirits. This is a supernatural ability to distinguish between spirits such as good and evil, truthful or deceiving prophetic versus satanic that you may be established, and they help establish people. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often plan to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and the barbarians, both to wise and unwise, so as much as is in me. I am ready to preach the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Let's say that together. I'll say it first and then you say it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. <clears throat> for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And now the subject changes somewhat. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who oppress the truth, suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, did they, not, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their hearts were foolish and darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like incorruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And that can include mindsets too. Sometimes we have wrong mindsets that we apply to being the truth of God when they're actually not. They're just things we believe that aren't true. <clears throat> for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men, committing what is shameful, that's homosexuality, isn't it? And receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind, to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, malice, maliciousness, full of envy, murder. See, it's easy to point out homosexuality and lesbianism, but even envy is the same as that. Murder. See, envy is no different to murder. Strife. But the interesting thing about envy and murder is, in a criminal law, you're going, to be, you're going to suffer the consequences of murder. But envy you can get away with. Strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers. Now this is most Christians. Backbiters and Jehovah Witnesses. Haters of God. Now I wouldn't include them there. Violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Disobedient to parents. Undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So that was a bit of a um, hard ending there on Romans chapter 1, but that took half an hour. So this is Dr. Jason W. Morrison at 8.04 a.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time, New South Wales, Australia, theologist, Bye for now. Yeah, Dr. Jason Morrison, theologist again. I just want to say thank you for watching the videos and I uh, hope you got plenty of uh, self-rediscovery and freedom out of it. If you watched it on YouTube, please share or like. Um, maybe even comment. If you watch it on Facebook, like, comment, share. Um, but most of all, get out and live. This isn't a rehearsal. You've got a one-off life. Don't let your loyalty and your faithfulness blind you to the life that you should be experiencing. Till the next video, thank you for watching and bye for now.